So Matthew 28, 16 to 20, inside your newsletter, on the screen or in your Bibles, page 886. The 11 disciples travelled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that it is clear. I thank you that it is not a textbook, a guidebook, a checklist or a map, but your word is the revelation of your nature. Our Father, as we come to a part of your nature that stretches our brains and is a struggle at points for us to comprehend, help us to get a glimpse of what it means for you to be Trinity and the consequences for who we are as people who live in community representing you to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, If you open your newsletters there, you'll have an outline, uh, and the outline is on the left-hand side. Two of the Bible readings are on the right-hand side. Uh, There's household questions up the top to discuss later on, and uh, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end of the sermon. Uh, There are a lot of passages we're going to be jumping through, and so there will be some slides up here uh, to help you navigate what we're doing. I'm at point one on the outline, Jesus spends a last moment with his closest followers, 11 disciples. Uh, He's trained them to be eyewitnesses who once he is physically gone, he'll send out into the world to proclaim what they have seen. Uh, As he spends his time with his disciples right at the end before he goes up to sit at his father's right hand, he lays out a revelation, he gives them a command, he shows them a method and then he reassures them. And taken together, they help us understand who God's mob are wherever you meet them in the world. And the revelation is that of the nature of Jesus. He has how much authority? All authority. Where, where does he have this authority? In heaven and on earth. See there in verse 18? There's no rival to Jesus. I've got aspirations, but there's no rival to Jesus. He is unique, as we heard last week. He is holy and he rules all the universe in all of history. That's the revelation. And because of that revelation, Jesus then issues a command. It's there in verse 19, make disciples. These men are to go into the whole world to replicate themselves, to make wholehearted student followers of Jesus. That's not a mysterious task. Jesus then gives them a method. It's in verses 19 to 20, there to go, baptise, teach. It's an all-encompassing task. Uh, Which nations are they to go to? All nations. This is a command that's colourblind, without exception, without discrimination. Slightly overwhelming, isn't it? Especially for those 11 as they look at the universe. And so as he finishes, Jesus reassures them, the one who has all authority who has given them a task for all the nations, will be with them all the time until the end of all the ages. There in verse 20. When that authority is obeyed, when the command is carried out, when the method is used, when the reassurance is accepted, what will we find when we go throughout the world? Well, the answer is there in verse 19, isn't it? You'll find a community in every nation which bears the name of the God they serve. And what's that name? It's there in those verses, isn't it? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see, that's what baptism is. Baptism is a public declaration, a public symbol that we can all comprehend that this person being baptised is a member of that community, that mob, a community that has an identity which has got a name, and it's the name of one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the community of God's mob. One God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so that community looks like that God. 
who is Trinity. Now, are we going to unpack that a little further? But let me just deal with some questions that might be in your... They might not be the questions you've got. They might just be my questions and I want to fill out a paragraph. But the word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. Uh, It's a word from outside the Bible that's been brought in to explain a really clear biblical concept. So we're not dealing with an idea we've imposed... It's not something borne out by a bunch of philosophers hanging around on a high table trying to make things more complicated. It's actually a very clear biblical concept that's explained by a word that's brought in. And I hope you'll understand from what we've just seen from Matthew 28, it's deeply practical. It's actually connected with every part of who we are as God's people. A bloke called Tertullian, who, funnily enough, was a lawyer, was the first person to use the Latin word, Trinitas, uh, around about the 3rd century. Some Greeks had used the Greek version a little earlier. Uh, But Tertullian is the bloke who helps us understand this concept and gives us a lot of the language, even the word person. Uh, That comes through Tertullian, helping us to think through what God is really like. Uh, So let's lay out the foundation of who God is. We're at the second point in the outline. We're going to look at God's mob in and of himself. Uh, God's word is very clear. There is only one of him. There is one God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, listen Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. Uh, It's the truth proclaimed right throughout God's word. From the opening verses of Genesis, the first book, through to what God says here through his mob as they get ready to take the land he's promised them, into a book called Isaiah where a bloke is talking to God's people, God's word, Isaiah 45, where there is no one like God. God is unique. There is only one of him. Uh, Into the start of the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, there is one Lord, there is one spirit, there is one God, right through to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 4 and 5 which we looked at last week. There's only one person at the cockpit of the universe. There is one God. And yet that description of one God is applied to three persons. God the Father, amongst many verses, is described as God in Romans 15 verse 6. God the Son is described as God amongst many verses in Acts 20 verse 28. God the Spirit, amongst many verses, is described as God in Acts 5, 3 to 4. And that's just not what God says about himself, but what a whole bunch of people now recognize about God himself. In John 10, 30, the Father and the Son are the same. They're God. Uh, At the end of the Gospels, uh, Thomas bows down to Jesus and describes him as my God, and gives him what he would only give to God. Uh, In John 14, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are described as God. A God is one and three persons in one. And they're never described in the Bible as ever kind of having a little less godness so one of the others gets more godness. They're all God all the time. One God, three persons, all God, all the time. That's the Trinity. And what did Trinder say about it? It's mysterious, isn't it? <laughs> this little noggin and this little heart is not going to comprehend the bigness of that. Uh, see, I remember last week we discussed being holy by talking about the platypus because I said you've got to be able to describe God is in words that make sense in woolies. I, I couldn't actually navigate that one with the Trinity because it is so big. But perhaps the best way of describing it is that in and of himself, God is a community. God is a mob in himself. He is individuals in community, united in a way that shows they're indistinguishable. And that community has always existed. It's self-sufficient. It doesn't lack anything. It doesn't have a starting point. It doesn't have an end point. There is nothing like it. That being the case, why is it so important? Why is this so crucial 
for us as God's mob. It's clearly in God's word, and we've only just skipped the tops of the waves there. We've seen its reality. It's a label that God's mob bear anywhere in the world. Uh, It's the community into which disciples are born. But why is it so important, this God is Trinity? Well, you'll see there on your outline at point three that I suggest a number of reasons it's important. Now, we're not going to go through all these Bible passages, but we're going to dip into some of them. And the first is uh, God is important as Trinity because it's crucial for the good news for the news that people like us can have our sins forgiven and be reconciled to God. Uh, It's not too much to say that if you don't have the Trinity, you don't have the good news. If you don't have the Trinity, there is no good news. Uh, There at the birth of Jesus, at his conception, Matthew 1, 18 to 25, who's present? The Trinity. Uh, The child in Mary's womb is conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's emphasised twice. The child itself is described as God's son. And this child is described as God himself in the flesh with his people, Emmanuel. Uh, At the conception and birth of Jesus, you've got the Trinity. Uh, In the baptism of Jesus, which Max read to us, Matthew 3, you've got it there in your newsletters, the start of his public ministry where he's out and about openly. Who's there? There's the Trinity. The son is baptised. The Spirit descends upon the Son and then the Father publicly speaks and says, that's my boy. And there you've got the Trinity. If you go to the next chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 11, Jesus is tempted or tested depending on how you read the words there. And in Matthew 4, 1 to 11, who's present at that moment? Well, you have God the Son being led by God the Spirit into the desert and every time the devil tests Jesus at that point, three times, He's targeting Jesus' sonship, if you really are the son of God. So the father's there. In the temptation and testing of Jesus, you have the Trinity. And you go back to the end of Matthew's Good News biography, Matthew 27, 45 to 56, you'll find the Trinity there on the cross. As the son breathes his last and cries out about his abandonment by God, what does he give up? His spirit. And you've got the Trinity at the cross. And so the good news is inseparable from the news that God is Trinity. And at every point, the Trinity is working for the salvation of God's people. They don't all work the same. They're equal, but they're different, aren't they? Think of a passage like John three sixteen: For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. God initiates and sends the Son, which we see in Isaiah 53, verse 10, where God's will is to crush his boy. And then you go through to John 14, and God initiates, sends his Son, and the Son does the job, returns to the Father, and the Spirit sent, so we can understand and have the good news applied. There is a quality, all God, all one, but there's distinction and difference. And without the Trinity, there's no good news. It's crucial for the community of God's people. It's crucial because God himself is a community. And in those final words that Jesus gives to his disciples, they're going out to make a community, aren't they? They're talking to individuals, disciples from every nation who are then baptised into a mob a mob with God and a mob with each other, vertical and horizontal. And you need that community vertically and horizontally for the world to know how significant God is. John 14, 19 to 26, which you can look at later on, is crucial to that. The Father, the Son and the Spirit are living together. And people like us are welcomed into that. God makes that happen as Jesus forgives our sins. And the description there in John 14 is God makes his home with his people. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. That's the meal of the household. We have dinner with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that's expressed in obedience. We're in the home with God, and we show we love him by obeying him. 
and it's a community with God and each other. Without the Trinity, there's no such thing as Christian community. It doesn't exist. It's crucial for godliness, for God's people growing more and more like God. God promises to do that. Colossians 3, 10 to 12, his people are being renewed in the image of God. How's that going to happen? God sends Jesus so we know what it looks like and the Spirit so we're reminded. And when that happens, Galatians 5.22 tells us we'll bear the fruit of the Spirit. If you belong to Jesus, you'll look like the Father and the Spirit will change you. And you'll bear fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness and self-control which is one big piece of fruit. Distinct attributes, but one bit of fruit. Without God being Trinity, there's no change in God's people. How crucial is it? It's crucial for good news, for community, for being changed. And it's consistent. It's right throughout God's word. It's there in the opening two verses God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, uh, Who was hanging around? Verse 2. The Spirit was hovering over the waters. It's there when God gets his mob in the desert to build a tent to show he wants to live with them. And he sends his Spirit so the craftsmen are really good at their job. It's there in Isaiah 9 where God himself says to his people, I'm going to come as a baby and live with you guys. Uh, It's there when David laments his sin in Psalm 51 that Max read and and says, God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, It's there in the Old Testament, but it's revealed most fully in the New Testament, except for this one little place in the first chapter of the Bible. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image, he created him in the image of God, he created them, male and female. God blessed them, God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, every creature that crawls on the earth. There's the Trinity. At the very moment we are made male and female, Let us make man one in our likeness. Individuals in community. Individuals as male and female, like God, portraying God, not the same as God. Two, equal but different, who together show the community of God. What God is like. Knit into the fabric of the world. That's right throughout God's word. Everywhere you look, you'll see that. And it's also consistent in church history. We're an Anglican church from an Anglican denomination. And in our articles of belief, we're a community of how many creeds? Three creeds. Uh, We used one today, didn't we? The Apostles' Creed, which is used most widely across all Christian denominations. Uh, What creed did we say last week? We used the Nicene Creed last week, didn't we? Uh, Thankfully, we only use the Athanasian Creed once a year, and that's on Reformation Sunday. We're a church of three creeds, and what do you notice about all those three creeds? I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. If a creed isn't Trinitarian, don't say it. It's not worth saying, because it isn't a statement about the nature of God, who is three in one. So... We've hung out in the ivory tower for a while, haven't we? We've looked at Jesus' last words to his disciples, which say that wherever his disciples are, they bear the name of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We've then seen why that's crucial. We've seen that it's crucial for the good news, for the community, for godliness, that it's consistent through God's word and across church history. What's it going to look like tomorrow morning? What's it going to look like tomorrow morning? Fundamentally, it means this. We believe in God as Trinity. One God, three persons, all God. And there's only one of him. That is the name we bear as wholehearted student followers of Jesus 
And that is a name that distinguishes us from so many others. It distinguishes us from every individual human that says, I'm God. That's the nature of sin, isn't it? It distinguishes us from Jews. It distinguishes us from Muslims. It distinguishes us from Jehovah's Witnesses, all of whom say Jesus is not God. So it sets us apart in the world, doesn't it? In fact, we can't be saved in a relationship with God if we don't believe God is Trinity because the Trinity works for our salvation. It is crucial. It is why the Athanasian Creed begins and ends with, unless you believe this, you are not saved. To be a disciple is to believe that God is Trinity. That's why Jesus gives that command. Because to be a disciple means that the community has worked for you and brought you into community with God himself. You cannot be a Christian who says, I'm a rock and an individual. You are an individual saved into community. Community with God and community with God's people. God is Trinity shapes not just our salvation, but how we understand community and living together in this world. To believe God is Trinity is to believe that that truth is accessible across every cultural boundary. That's the name and discipleship that the disciples took to how many nations? All nations. It is a fundamentally colorblind doctrine. And so too must be God's people. Reflecting the truth that God is Trinity is for every nation because, as we saw in Genesis 1, how many humans are made in God's image? All humans. Maleness and femaleness is not a cultural construct we put on. It's part of our humanity so that as a community, male and female, we reflect the nature of God to the world which means that within God's community, men and women are equal but different. Who's God? God is Trinity. One God, three persons, all God. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It is mysterious at this point, and really what we've just covered is immensely dense, but hopefully, Father, we've seen how immensely practical it is for us reflecting you to the world, for us dealing with people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds, for us understanding uh, what it means to be male and female, for what it means to be a community, for how this is a deep and unique revelation of your very nature. Father, help us to know you as Trinity, to live you as Trinity, and to proclaim you as Trinity. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Good on you, Pete. Uh, well, where do the angels start in? Where do the angels fit in? Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? So Pete's asked a really uh, helpful question. Uh, where do the angels fit in with this? Uh, we know a number of things about the angels. Uh, what do we know about their creation? Whose image are the angels made in? They're not made in God's image, are they? So angels can't represent God as he is to the world. That's reserved for one group of people. Who's that? Males and females who are human. Okay. So whatever angels are, they don't represent God to the world as he truly is. Okay. Second thing about angels is when we meet them in the Bible, what are their jobs? They really seem to me to have two jobs. What are their jobs? So they're God's postal service. Okay. And it's interesting, wherever we meet them, they're described as being like humans, but they aren't described as being humans, are they? That's really helpful. One like a person shining. That's what the people see when they come to the tomb. Uh, When we met the angels last week in Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4 and 5, uh, they were amazingly bizarre, not human-like at all. 
but like one of them bore that. So they're God's postal service. They serve one other job, don't they, in the Bible? What is it? What is it, Steve? Warriors. They're God's army. Uh, so when you meet them, uh, especially in the book of Revelation, sometimes in the Old Testament where God sends his army to fight for his people, uh, you have angels there. They're led by who? Michael. It seems to me, I know this This is just random, Gabriel leads the postal service, Michael leads the army. Okay. But they're not humans. They don't represent God as he truly is. So they are another creation of God, but they're not us. Does that make sense? But it's helpful pegging all of those things out. Helpful pegging all those things, because that helps us limit how infatuated we get with them. Be infatuated with God. Be obsessed with Jesus. Be filled by the Holy Spirit. Know where the angels place in God's economy. 